Hello guys, now in this video we will be discussing about cervical intraepithelial neoplasia also known as CIN. See guys, in the name itself it is very clear that in the cervix intraepithelial okay, neoplasia is happening. See usually cancers will undergo metastasis but here this is not a cancer but it just limited okay, abnormal growth of cells is limited to the cervical epithelial cells okay the basement membrane is still intact and the abnormal cells are not metastasizing okay so let's see some important points regarding the cervix what exactly is this transformation zone guys see this transformation zone it's a dynamic point it usually changes from one place to other first of all what exactly is this transformation zone this transformation zone is also known as SC junction. SC means squamocolumnar junction. Guys, please remember the endocervix is lined by, okay, endocervix is lined by columnar epithelial cells and exocervix is lined by squamous epithelial cells. The place where the squamous epithelium is getting converted into columnar epithelium that junction okay that junction is known as this thing okay which you can see in red right that junction is known as transformation zone or squamocolumnar junction important point is it's a dynamic point it usually changes according to the time see it moves with age and hormonal influences what does i mean by see this dynamic point which is a transformation zone it is usually moving inward okay it will be taken up into the cervix when with age okay as she is getting old the transformation zone is moving in but when it will move out guys it moves out during pregnancy puberty and if she is using oral contraceptive pills so whenever there is pregnancy or whenever there is like you know whenever the female is in puberty this transformation zone is more of outside it's the most common site for cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and cervical cancer. This is the one important site from which the cervical cancer and cervical intraepithelial neoplasia arises. Okay, so these are some important points regarding the transformation zone or SC junction. Now let's see cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Guys, again I am repeating. Here the abnormal cells are still present in the like you know epithelium they are not going beyond the basement membrane basement membrane is still intact okay see according to who the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia is classified into three types cin1 cin2 and cin3 see in cin1 you will be having mild dysplasia what does it mean by mild dysplasia the dysplastic cells are seen in the lower one third of the epithelial lining of the cervix. Okay, only in the lower one third of the cervical lining. In CIN2, it's a little bit more dangerous. That is moderate dysplasia is seen. Okay, it's not complete neoplasia, abnormal cells. Okay, dysplastic cells are seen in the lower two third of the epithelial lining of cervix. So here it is lower one third, it's a little bit extending. Lower two third of the epithelial lining is getting affected. In CIN3, there is a severe dysplasia. What does it mean by severe dysplasia? Dysplastic cells are seen in more than two-third of the epithelial lining of the cervix. Now, after the CIN1, CIN2, CIN3, you will be having a stage known as carcinoma in situ, where the total dysplastic cells are seen in the full thickness of the basement membrane, but still the basement membrane is intact. Okay, so what are the stages in the like you know cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, guys? It's a CIN1, CIN2, CIN3 carcinoma in situ. Okay, so in CIN1 it is mild dysplasia, CIN2 is moderate dysplasia, CIN3 is severe dysplasia, and like you know carcinoma in situ means the full thickness of the cervical epithelial lining is filled with the dysplastic or abnormal cells. See, this is WHO classification. According to Bethesda classification, cervical intraepithelial neoplasia is divided into two types L cell, low squamous intraepithelial lesion, and H cell. Guys, please consider that the low squamous intraepithelial lesion, L cell, 
is equivalent to CAN1 of WHO classification. See, according to Bethesda, it is LCL. But according to WHO, it is CAN1. And HCL, which includes CAN2, CAN3 and carcinoma in situ. Okay, HCL means according to Bethesda classification, HCL includes CAN2, CAN3 and carcinoma in situ. Now, please concentrate this image. Guys, this is a normal histology of the cervix. Okay, this one. Please concentrate here. The lower one third, okay, lower one third is getting affected in CAN1, that is mild dysplasia. In CAN2, in CAN2, this is CAN1, which is LCL according to Bethesda. In CAN2, there is a moderate dysplasia where there is two third, two third of the lower epithelial lining is getting affected. In CAN3, that is a severe dysplasia, greater than two third is getting affected. But in carcinoma in situ, it is a whole, whole cervix, okay, whole, like, you know, epithelial lining, whole length of the epithelial lining is filled with the abnormal or dysplastic cells. So, after cars, but still, please concentrate, the basement membrane is still intact, okay, the, these abnormal cells are not getting metastasized. Till here, it is CAN, okay, till here, it is CAN. Once the basement membrane is broken, okay, once the basement membrane is broken, these abnormal epithelial cells will start to metastasize. That is known as microinvasive carcinoma, which is a first stage of cervical cancer. Okay, micro, microinvasive carcinoma, it's coming under cervical cancer. But here, now we are going to discuss only about the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, which was divided into CAN1, CAN2, CAN3 and carcinoma in situ according to WHO classification and LCL and HCL according to Bethesda classification. Please note guys, in invasive carcinoma, okay, in invasive carcinoma, there is a breach in basement membrane. Okay, in invasive carcinoma, see it's a name also very clear. It's a carcinoma. We are saying that it's a carcinoma. Okay, so in invasive carcinoma, there is a breach in the basement membrane. But in carcinoma in situ, there is no breach in the basement membrane. Only full thickness of the epithelial lining is filled with the abnormal cells or dysplastic cells. Now, Let's see what are the predisposing factors for the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Why she is getting this dysplastic growth of cells in her cervical epithelial lining? The single most important agent is HPV infection, human papilloma virus infection. It's a STD, sexually transmitted disease. Now, if she is having uh, any promiscuity, if she is having multiple sexual partners, Okay, she is at a high risk of developing this cervical intraepithelial lesion. See, it's intraepithelial, only located inside the epithelial cells, not metastasizing. Okay, that's why we are saying CIN, not cervical cancer. Cancer is metastasizing. So, if she is having HPV infection, she is at a risk of developing this CIN. Intercourse before 18 years of age, before 18 years of age, the transformation zone is more like, you know, more likely to be outside. So that transformation zone can be easily affected with this HPV. So intercourse before 18 years of age is a high risk factor for developing this CIN. Promiscuity means multiple sexual partners. Multiparity means like, you know, more number of babies. If she is a multiparous woman, then it's more likely that transformation zone is more outside so it will be easily affected with the HPV. Poor socioeconomic status means like you know she is not having a proper uh, hygiene okay proper hygiene in her genital tract or she might be a commercial sexual worker like you know she doesn't have a good knowledge about like you know uh, all these uh, genital STDs okay uh, sexually transmitted diseases so that that increases the risk for like you know her HPV infection that can lead to CAN or squamous cell carcinoma and immunocompromised individuals guys this is important most of the females you know most of the females like you know by somehow get this hpv okay somehow but if you are properly immunocompetent this hpv cannot do anything but especially in those females who are immunocompromised this this hpv will lead to cervical intraepithelial lesion that can even progress to cervical cancer okay that's the one point I want you to remember. And OCP use, okay, if a female is using long-term oral contraceptive pills, that can also increase the risk for cervical intraepithelial 
neoplasia and in it in utero exposure to diethyl silvestrol see taking diethyl silvestrol by the mother if the baby like you know during pregnancy during pregnancy if mother is taking this diethyl silvestrol this diethyl silvestrol will cause congenital abnormalities diethyl silvestrol will cause con especially with the reproductive tract so that her uh, transformation zone is more outside that increases the risk for the hpv infection that will cause can now let's see some important points about this human papilloma virus which is the most common etiological factor for the development of a can okay it's a most common etiological factor associated with a cin okay now what are the high risk hpv there are many subtypes of hpvs like you know high risk hpvs include 16 18 31 33 35 and so on like you know main important points i want you to remember is 16 and 18 hpv 16 and 18 are very very high risk hpvs okay now hpv 16 is going to cause squamous cell carcinoma of cervix guys remember this hpv is not only associated with cervical intraepithelial neoplasia cin but also this hpv can cause cervical cancer okay once if you are affected with this hpv first of all it will cause cin and that can lead to cervical cancer okay so hpv is associated both with cin as well as cervical cancer hpv 16 is associated with squamous cell carcinoma of cervix okay like you know cervical cancer is of two types cervical uh, like you know squamous cell carcinoma as well as adenocarcinoma hpv 18 is associated with adenocarcinoma hpv 16 is associated with squamous cell carcinoma 80% of the women are infected with hpv at some point of the time but mo in most of them nothing is going to happen why because they are immunocompetent but in those females who are immunocompromised there you can expect this cin and cervical cancer in females it causes okay this hpv it causes cervical cancer we know that it causes cin we know not only cin cervical cancer but it also causes vaginal anal and oral cancers also hpv causes cervical vaginal anal and oral cancers okay what it will do it infects the basal epithelial cells okay cervical basal epithelial cells and leads to cholecystosis cholecystosis is a microscopic appearance okay see here okay it's a very important term they will ask you cholecystosis is associated with which virus it's a hpv virus okay cholecystosis is nothing but you know the nucleus the prominent nucleus is like you know sent to the periphery and you are having a big vacuole in the cytoplasm okay so that's what exactly is cholecystosis which is associated with the hpv infections especially this hpv is going to affect the epithelial cells basal epithelial cells and microscopically you see this appearance cholecystosis where the nucleus is sent to the periphery and you are going to have a prominent big vacuole inside the cytoplasm now okay if the female is having cin1 cin2 or cin3 now please concentrate 60% of the time 60% of the time cin1 will becomes normal okay cin1 means what guys cin1 means dysplastic cells seen in the lower one third of the epithelial line cin2 is little bit more dangerous cin3 is little bit more dangerous we know that but when a female is having cin1 60% of the time she will become normal her epithelial lining will become normal ca into 40% of the time she will become normal which means 60% of the time she will go into ca in 3 something like that and ca in 3 30% of the time she will become normal means ca in 1 it's very good why because 60% of the cases will become normal ca in 3 is bad why because only 30% of the cases will become normal 70% of the cases will progress to ca in 2 ca in 3 carcinoma in situ okay micro invasive carcinoma later to cervical cancer okay something like that persistence what does it mean by persistence remains same so 30% of the time 30% of the time cin1 remains as cin1 there is no change and 35% of the time cin2 stays as cin2 and 50% of the time cin3 it just persist it is going to be like that okay progression to cin3 progression to carcinoma guys this is the one impo- in this entire slide this is the one point i want you to remember whether you remember the above points or not it doesn't matter but this is very very important cin1 changing into cancer cervical intraepithelial neoplasia this is just like you know this is actually not a cancer to be very frank this is not a cancer why because it's not metastasizing abnormal cells are lying only in the cervical epithelial lining that's it okay these are just dysplastic cells not the neoplastic cells 
Now, progression to cancer. See, this CIN1 only less than 1% of the time will progress to cancer. But the CIN3, 20% of the time will progress to cervical cancer. This is the very, very important point. CIN3, she will go into cancer 20% of the times. Okay. Now, let's see some important screening test. Okay. Guys, most common age group, like you know, where we can do, uh, like you know, uh, where, like you know, where we can see the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. Okay, what is the most common age group that's going to be affected? It is the 20 to 30 years. Okay, now what is the screening test which we can do? It's a Pap smear, which we will do as a screening test. Okay, now time for Pap smear. When we have to do this Pap smear in a female, for example, a female is 21 years, and when we have to do this pap smear guys please remember the time for pap smear is 21 years regardless the age of first intercourse okay it doesn't matter when she have participated in the intercourse she doesn't participate in the intercourse it doesn't matter see from 21 years of time we can do this pap smear to rule out the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia so we will having a lot of time so that we can prevent the conversion of this cervical intraepithelial neoplasia into cancer. So we can do this pap smear as a screening test. When we have to do, done two weeks after the last menstrual period. After the last menstrual period, we have to wait two weeks, that's a 14 days. And we can do this pap smear. What exactly we are going to do in this pap smear? Guys, what we'll be doing, we're taking is IR spatula, okay? We'll be taking IR spatula and endocervical brush, okay? IR spatula and endocervical brush is taken. With this, we are going to collect the epithelial cells from the cervix. Definitely not from vagina, not from the uterus. We will be taking the cells from the cervix. And what we will be doing? We will collect those cells. We will culture them. We will put it under the microscope. And we will see the cytology, whether the cells are properly there or not. Whether there is any dysplastic changes or not. That's what we will do in the pap smear. Okay. So, in a woman age of 21 to 29 years, if a woman is between 21 to 29 years, once in every three years, okay, once in every three years, she have to go through this cytological study that is pap smear, okay, once in every three years, a female of age 21 to 29 should have to undergo pap smear test. Why? Because if there is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, we will start the treatment so that the cervical intraepithelial neoplasia won't be converted into cervical cancer. Okay, we'll get this window period. Okay. Now, so women age of 30 to 65 years. Now, this age group women, they have to undergo this pap smear test once in every five years. Th those are some important, important points and what we will be actually doing in this pap smear guys with the help of this IR spatula and cytobrush, okay, uh, cytobrush or the endocervical brush, what you will be doing is you will be collecting the epithelial cells from the cervix and you will be culturing them and putting under the microscope, examining those cells, okay. Now, alternatives to the cytology, okay. So, alternatives to the cytology in the cells, alternative to the pap smear. Apart from pap smear, what else you can do? See, you can do visual inspection of cervix with 5% acetic acid that is known as via okay so visual inspection of the cervix directly you are seeing the cervix not you are not collecting the epithelial cells you are just directly going to put 5% acetic acid onto the cervix and you are directly visualizing it okay if there is a dysplastic cells you can see a white area that is known as aceto white areas near the SC junction. Why? Because SC junction is the most common site for CAN as well as cervical cancer. So what you will be doing is you are going to put a 5% acetic acid onto the cervix. There is a dysplastic cell or there is a CAN. You can visually document that there is the dysplastic cells. How means? You will see a white aceto, like you know, aceto white areas. You can also do Willy. What does it mean by Willy? Visual inspection, here also you are visually documenting. Visual inspection under Lugol's iodine. Instead of 5% acetic acid, here you are going to put Lugol's iodine. Normal cells appear brown or mahogany in color. Okay, normal cells will be in brown color. But dysplastic cells appear unstained or yellow in color. If you find yellow color after putting this uh, Lugol's iodine, for example, something like over here, you can see 
yellow color. See, this is the willy. Okay, visual inspection and also lugal iodine. Here you can see a aceto white area, aceto white area. So, this is an indicative of a dysplastic cell. Okay, this is an indication of dysplastic cell. So, these are alternative to cytology, guys. So, what actually you have to do? You have to do the pap smear. But if pap smear is not available, then you can do via or willy. These are alternatives. Now, what are the management strategies for various cytological abnormalities? Okay, you have performed pap smear. If pap smear is normal, what you will do? You will ask the female, okay, regularly, okay, undergo this pap smear once in every three years. If she is between 21 to 29 years. If she is between 31 to 39 years, like, you know, you will be asking her, like, you know, uh, once in every five years, okay, she have to go through this pap smear. Okay, well and good. Now, if pap smear is normal, Resume pap smear as per ACOG. Okay, well and good. See, whenever you are having ascus, that is atypical squamous cells of unknown significance. Okay, if you are seeing some atypical cells, okay, upon cytology, after doing cytology, when you find this atypical squamous cells, then what you have to do? Repeat after six months, repeat the pap smear after six months. If you are seeing more number of this ascus, more number of atypical cells, then what you have to do? do colposcopy okay after pap smear you have to do the colposcopy that's the best option okay if you see ask us repeat the pap smear after six months if the number of atypical cells are getting increased then do the colposcopy okay now see if there is a l cell what is meant by l cell guys l cell is nothing but cin1 in wh4 that is dysplastic cells are localized only to the lower one third of the epithelial lining See, if there is L cell, what you will do is you will do colposcopy. Means after pap smear, if there is some abnormality in pap smear report, you will confirm it by doing colposcopy where you are magnifying the cervix, like you know, and visually, like you know, documenting whether there is any problem or not. Okay, so I will show you that. Don't worry. So you will be doing colposcopy if there is L cell, or if there is a H cell, also you will be doing the colposcopy. But if it is L cell, Along with colposcopy, you will plus or minus, it's totally up to you. Okay, you can or cannot do like an you know, endocervical curatage. Okay, endocervix, like you no know, curatage. But if it is H cell, definitely along with colposcopy, you should also do endocervical curatage. See, guys, if you are visually able to see the lesion, okay, if you are visually able to see the lesion, also do punch biopsy. Okay, even in H cell, if, you are, if the lesion is visu visible, okay, the lesion is visible, you can do the punch biopsy. Simple guys, first of all, what you have to do? You have to ask the woman to undergo pap smear regularly according to the ACOG guidelines. After doing pap smear, if you find any abnormalities, you should go with the colposcopy. If it is L cell, colposcopy plus or minus endocervical curatage. If the lesion is visible, you can do the cone biopsy, sorry, punch biopsy. If it is H cell, you can do colposcopy along with endocervical curatage. Also, if the lesion is visible, you can do punch biopsy. Okay. So, colposcopy is a gold standard for evaluation of abnormal cervical cytology. It's not the pap smear. After pap smear, you have to do the colposcopy. Now, see, this is the colposcope. Okay. Here is the colposcope where you are visually seeing, like, you know, magnifying the cervix and you are visually documenting the lesion. Okay. Now, cone biopsy. What is this cone biopsy? For example, not example, let me tell you when exactly you will be doing this cone biopsy. First of all, what you have done, guys, you have done pap smear, okay, well and good. After pap smear, what you have done, according to HCL, LCL, ASCUS, you will be doing colposcopy, okay. Guys, if there is any discrepancy between these two, pap smear is showing that there is a lesion. Colposcopy, everything is normal. Now, there is a discrepancy between these two results. Then to confirm, you will do the cone biopsy. Okay. So, to confirm the findings of colposcopy. Remember, to confirm the findings of colposcopy, you can go with the cone biopsy. See, if there is any discrepancy in pap smear result and colposcopy result, you can do the cone biopsy. Means you are taking the biopsy of the cervix. Okay. If Squamocolumnar junction is not visible on the colposcopy. You have performed the, like, you know, colposcopy after pap smear, but you are unable to see this squamocolumnar junction. 
you have to see the squamous columnar junction why, why because that's the main important place where cervical intraepithelial neoplasia and cervical cancer is going to occur okay so if you are not able to see this uh, squamous columnar junction okay on colposcopy then you have to go with the cone biopsy invasive carcinoma is suspected okay based on colposcopy you okay, you have done the colposcopy or you have done the pap smear guys you are suspecting that there is a micro invasive carcinoma guys can you able to know with pap smear please remember can you able to know with pap smear there is a breach in the basement membrane no you cannot definitely you cannot know with the pap smear result or with colposcopy you cannot know whether there is a breach in the membrane that's a basement membrane or not so what you can do you can do the punch biopsy and in the punch biopsy like you know you have to make the slides and in these slides you can see whether there is breach in the basement membrane or not whether these abnormal cells are metastasizing out of the epithelial lining or not so if you are suspecting the micro invasive carcinoma you should go for cone biopsy okay so what are the complications of this cone biopsy guys the complications are bleeding okay infection cervical stenosis and cervical incompetence okay whenever like you know if you perform this cone biopsy the main important problems is the stenosis that can lead to that can lead to like you know uh, infertility in the female and like you know cervical incompetence especially second trimester like you know cervical incompetence will cause recurrent abortions okay those are the complications now see here also this is also slide like you know what are the indications for the cone biopsy you already know okay so whenever the squamous columnar junction is not seen okay uh, when uh, the limits the lesion cannot be visualized with the colposcopy okay with the colposcopy if you like you know if you are not able to see the lesion then you can go with the cone biopsy okay if endocervical curettage is positive in hcl this is also guys okay we haven't discussed this if the endocervical curettage is getting positive with hcl what does it mean by hcl that is cin2 cin3 cin uh, cin2 cin3 and the carcinoma in situ these are all considered under hcl so if you have any of them with endocervical curettage then also you can go with the cone biopsy if you are suspecting micro invasive carcinoma okay then also you can go with the cone biopsy and lack of correlation between cytology and colposcopy result that's we have already discussed right discrepancy in the results between pap smear and colposcopy then also you can indicate the cone biopsy guys important point is cone biopsy is not only diagnostic for the cin but it also therapeutic okay especially cancer in situ okay carcinoma in situ in young females okay if it is a carcinoma in situ or micro invasive carcinoma with cone biopsy you can treat it okay you, you just remove the like you know that part of the cervix so it's also therapeutic okay and like you know cancer cancer cervix stage 1a1 okay cancer cervix stage 1a1 is nothing but micro invasive carcinoma okay micro invasive carcinoma means breach in the basement membrane so for that it's a therapeutic thing we have already discussed right carcinoma in situ in the young females are cancer stage 1a1 okay so this is therapeutic also not only diagnostic now how you are going to manage cin1 okay female is having cin1 how you are going to manage guys before managing how we can prevent the development of cin1 see it can be preventive by giving a bivalent quadrivalent or even nine valent vaccines so this bivalent vaccine which is known as a cervarix it's going to be preventive against 16 and 18 so once if a female took this shot with this bivalent vaccine now she will be prevented again as 16 and 18 we all know that hpv 16 is going to cause squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix and hpv 18 is going to cause adenocarcinoma of the cervix okay now quadrivalent vaccine see this quadrivalent vaccine known as gardasil it's going to be preventive again as 6 11 16 as well as 18 and nine valent vaccine it's going to be a protective again as nine different strains of the hpv okay guys so these are the preventive measures but once if she is having the cin how you are going to manage see there are ablative measures and surgical measures something like you know, ablative ab ablative me methods include cryo surgery as well as laser ablation see cryo surgery and laser ablation are ablative methods you are totally destroying that and surgical excision methods like l lets 
which means large loop excision of the transformation zone you are excising the transformation zone okay loop electro excisional procedure which means leep you can do coniization or even you can do hysterectomy see we know the treatment like you know you can either go with the ablative methods or you either you can go with the surgical me methods when see according to the different different stages of the can you will choose whether you have to go with the ablative method or whether you will go with the surgical excision now let's see for example stage wise management of the can what does i mean by for example if a female is having can1 see you have to do observation do yearly hpv dna testing or pap smear every 6 to 12 months it's very simple if she is having can1 don't do anything simply observe her what you have to do yearly hpv dna you will be checking yearly hpv dna and also you will be doing pap smear every 6 to 12 months if she is having can1 see usually can1 normally regresses within 2 years within 2 years can1 should regress but if it persists then you have to do the cryotherapy ablative method right see if it is can1 persistent what you have to do ablative therapy cryo surgery need to be done okay cryotherapy if it is can2 or can3 it's very simple that you have to go with the leap what does it mean by leap guys leap means electro like loop electro excisional procedure okay loop electro excisional procedure which is known as leap that's a definitive treatment for can2 as well as can3 now if it's a recurrent can3 okay like it's a, again coming again 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 so then you have to do the hysterectomy way because can3 is having 20% of the chances that it can turn into cervical cancer now laser ablation is best if can is extending to the vaginal fornices okay if can if it is extending to the vaginal fornices okay into the regions of the vaginal fornices then laser ablation is the best method okay guys i hope the lecture is helpful thank you in the next video we'll be discussing about the cervical cancer